more than 30 seconds. It is as simple as this. I leave the stage. And then you hear from the two candidates after you've heard from some very prominent supporters. You'll rec I'm not going to spoil the surprise. Very, very heavyweight in the sense of their political abilities, supporters of each of the candidates. Then, they, of course, I get to have a bit of time with them, maybe about 10, 12 minutes. And then it's over to you. My colleagues have been around. I know they've collected all your questions. Do get involved. I've been very honored. I've been very privileged. I did the first one up in Leeds over a month ago. And I can tell you, the more you put in, the more you get out. So enjoy it. If you hear your candidate something, say something you like, let him or her know, and vice versa. They're going to feed off your energy. It's going to be broadcast live on LBC. It's going out on Global Player as well, so it's on TV. So you could be seen by about 35 million people globally. And, well, maybe slight overestimation, but get... <laughs> Get involved, okay? Really enjoy it. If you hear something you like, shout. If you don't, let us know as well. Thank you very much. Have a great evening, and I'll be taking your questions very shortly. Thank you for coming. Please welcome wow. Member of Parliament for Chingford and Woodford Green, Ian Duncan-Smith. Good evening, fellow London Conservatives. God, there's so many of you here tonight, I'm going to make a small plea for myself. I'm not standing at the last moment, don't worry. But I have a marginal constituency called Chingford and Woodford Green. Hands up those who are going to come and help me fight to beat Labour and the hordes of momentum at the next election. Very good, very good. Well, let me tell you now, we've had uh, a long time at this campaign. I've, uh, I fought seven campaigns. We do love to have leadership campaigns, don't we? <laughs> Maybe it's about membership. Maybe we think it boosts membership. But let me tell you, let's stop it here. Let's stop it now. The person that we elect this week has to take us forward to the next election. And I've been leader, I've served in government, and I know what disunity does to political parties. It leaves them in the wilderness for a long, long time. So tonight, and at the end of this week, can us all here tonight pledge that the one single winner will be conservative unity to take on the hordes of Labour at the next general election. <clears throat> But well, I'm here tonight to introduce uh, Liz Truss. Uh, I uh, haven't known... There you are. <laughs> I thought I saw a few Rishi posters come up as well at the same time, but no problem with it. Always good to hear that you're now cheering for Liz. What a great moment. Right, OK, so I'm here to introduce Liz Truss. And that's because I came to believe, when I looked at all the candidates, let me tell you now, we have really good people who could govern and lead this country, all of them. But we have to choose one. And I just want to say to you that when I looked at all of them, I came to the conclusion that Liz was the one that I thought would make the best leader and the leader most likely to take us forward to the next election and win it. Maybe, maybe you don't want to win it, but I do. Let me tell you, I do. And the reality here is that it's all, at the end of the day, about character. Yes, there's all the policies. Liz is right, I believe. I do not understand a Conservative government that thinks having high taxes is a benefit. Let me tell you that looking at recession as something that you have to do is completely wrong. Recession cripples families. It leaves them destitute, and it breaks their hopes and aspirations. Liz is right to say we must work to avoid recession at all costs. And she also, by the way, for all of us here, cut her political teeth in London as a councillor. 
So she gets London, she loves London. And when I talk to her about what one of our biggest problems is, it's the fact that right now, with these top-down targets, lots of Labour councils are using that as an excuse to build tower blocks all over low-rise family housing areas, the sort of constituencies many of us occupy. And she pledged immediately that we would eradicate those top-down targets, and that will help all of us and help the families living in our areas not to be dominated by tower blocks in their homes every single day. Liz is right. But the truth is, with all the policies that we may debate, you need to look carefully at the character of the individual. This is very, very important. All the time I've been in politics, in service, uh, whether I was in the army before and in government and in business, to me, the key test is about the character of the individual that you want to elect. It's about their strength, their determination, their clarity of purpose, and true loyalty to their fellow colleagues in determining and driving policy forward. These are important characteristics. And when I looked at Liz, I realized very quickly that this is somebody who has real determination and courage. She is quite prepared to take on the challenges. And the thing I say to you more than anything else at all is that when I look at Liz and I talk to her, I get that sense of real steel in her backbone. Someone who, once she has made her mind up, is prepared to drive that forward and to take on Labour. And by the way, Labour are enemies who are trying to get after us even as we speak. That steel reminds me of a person I used to know who was once Prime Minister. They used to say to her, you can't do this, you can't do that. You won't be able to get people on side. But Liz, in all of her time in government, has shown time and again she has defied those odds. She's produced the trade deals when people told her that she couldn't. And she's supported the Prime Minister in driving help over for Ukraine. I wear this badge to support Ukraine because even as we debate tonight, they are dying for freedom. We owe them every bit of support we can give them. <clears throat> and it was Liz Truss with Ben and with Boris who have led the world in getting that support to them. Courage, determination, and character. These are the key issues that will dominate this debate. So I hope, like the rest of those of us who already declared, that many of you will understand that without that character, without that ability, getting big decisions made and challenging the orthodoxy will simply not work. So it is tonight my incredible pleasure and honor to introduce for you Somebody that I hope and believe and that hope you will agree with me will make a great Prime Minister of this great United Kingdom. Please welcome the video for Liz Truss to be the next Prime Minister of this country. The United Kingdom is a great country and I know that a United Conservative Party can unleash the potential of all the people who make our country so great. To win the next election, we need to deliver, deliver and deliver for the British people. I know that our country's best days lie ahead. I'm the candidate with a clear vision for the future who can drive change and get things done. As Trade Secretary, I negotiated deals with allies like Australia and Japan, creating opportunities around the world for British business. And as Prime Minister, I will continue to deliver on the opportunities of Brexit. I will lead a government committed to core Conservative principles. Low taxes, a firm grip on spending, driving growth in the economy, and giving people the opportunity to achieve anything they want to achieve, regardless of their background. I will work day and night to lead a party and a government that puts more money in your pocket and secures a better life for you and your family. I've consistently delivered when I have said I would. And I love our country. I want the best for us all and I'm the person to deliver that.
Please welcome Liz Truss. in London, in Wembley, and just one month ago, we saw the Lionesses, I watched them at Wembley Stadium, on the pitch, winning our first major tournament since 1966. And they did it with a combination of determination, courage, and a will to win. And that's the spirit I want us to have as the United Kingdom. Now, I'm not from a traditional conservative background. I grew up in Paisley in Scotland and in Leeds in Yorkshire, where I went to a comprehensive school. And what I saw at my school is I saw some children being let down. They were let down by low expectations because of the area of the city that they lived in. They were let down because of Leeds City Council, who cared more about political correctness than making sure all the children understood English and maths. And they were let down by lack of opportunity in the area. And I thought that waste of talent was wrong. And that's why I'm in politics, because I want everybody wherever they live, wherever they're from, to have opportunity. I want us to be an aspiration nation. Now, now, we are not going to succeed as a country without a successful London. This is the greatest city on earth. And in order to level up, the United Kingdom, we need a successful London. But the reality is London is being let down by Sadiq Khan. <laughs> Sadiq Khan, Sadiq Khan is anti-everything. He's anti-car, he's anti-business, he's anti-opportunity, and he is holding London back. And I don't believe, I don't believe those people who say London is a Labour city. No, it is not. London, London is a city where people want opportunities and they want to get on in life, and that's what we can deliver, and we can make London conservative again. But I think we all know, we all know that we face difficult times. We have the appalling war in Ukraine, perpetrated by Putin, we have an energy crisis, and we have the aftermath of COVID. And we have had two decades of relatively low growth in this country. So what we can't have is business as usual. We need to be bold, and we need to do things differently. And that's what I would do if elected as your Prime Minister. First of all, I would have a bold plan for growth. I'd unlock the opportunities of Brexit, getting all of those EU laws off our statute books by the end of 2023. Yeah. Things, like, things like Solvency 2, making sure we unleash the City of London, our financial services institutions, to be able to deliver investment right across our country. I'd also cut taxes. We were wrong to raise national insurance. Yes. We said we wouldn't. We said we wouldn't. We said we wouldn't in our manifesto, and I believe in keeping your word. And we are still able, even if we reverse the increase, we are still able to start paying down the national debt in three years' time. I would also have a moratorium on the green energy levy. Because we need we need to give people immediate help on their fuel bills. And I'd also keep corporation tax low. 
raising corporation tax, raising corporation tax to the same level as France and 10 points higher than Ireland is not going to attract investment and growth into our country. And I'm fundamentally on the side of people who work hard and do the right thing. People who are, people who are self-employed, people who set up their own businesses, people who go into work every day. That's whose side we're on as Conservatives. Now, I joined the Conservative Party in 1996 in London, and I became a councillor later on in Greenwich. And one of my jobs as a councillor was to sit on the planning committee. <laughs> I see we've got a few people that sit on planning committees, and they will know that those are hours of your life you never get back. Because you think you're making the great decisions, but you get overruled by the top-down housing targets or by the planning inspectorate in Bristol. And what I would do is abolish those targets in legislation, and I would give power to local communities. I would enable the London suburbs who want the family homes to build the homes that they want and that local people want. And I would set up, I would set up low tax investment zones to drive jobs and growth across our city just like we did with the Docklands Development Corporation in the 1980s that now has created Canary Wharf. And I, I'll also work to stop the anti-growth madness of Sadiq Khan. Legislating to make sure essential train services are provided and they can't be disrupted by militant trade unions. But also, also tackling crime in our capital. We have seen crime go up. We have seen some appalling crimes committed. I'm afraid that too often women and girls in London are not able to go out for fear of crime, and I think that is wrong. And I will make sure our police are policing the streets and not policing Twitter. We also, we also need to stand up to Vladimir Putin. I'm proud that we were the first country to send weapons to Ukraine. And that I, as Foreign Secretary, put the toughest sanctions on Russia of any country in the world. But we, we can't be complacent. We can't be complacent. And that's why I would increase defense spending to 3% of GDP by the end of the decade. I'll also tackle the small boats in the English Channel. I supported the Rwanda scheme. We need to expand it to more countries, but I will also make sure we legislate so that we can't be overruled by the ECHR and we decide our policies about our borders. But as well, as well as freedom and democracy overseas, we also need to make sure we have free speech here at home. And there is too much left-wing identity politics. I'm, I'm very clear that a woman is a woman. And I will make sure I will make sure we protect our single sex spaces like our domestic violence shelters. And I will also stand up for the United Kingdom. I'm fed up of people talking our country down, saying that our best days are behind us, that we should be ashamed of our history. Those people are wrong. I believe our best days are ahead of us. And we, as Conservatives, are the ones who need to make it happen. We should be proud of being Conservatives. We should be proud of the values we stand for. And that is the way that we will deliver on our promises in 2019 and unleash Britain and all the opportunities in our great country. And that way, 
We will take on Keir Starmer, who doesn't understand aspiration. He's yet another Labour leader from North London. What do they have against people south of the river? I just don't get it. And what about, what about Sadiq Khan? He is talking London down, not talking it up. And we need to remove him too. I would be honoured to be your Prime Minister. First of all, to deliver for the United Kingdom, to deliver an election victory for the Conservatives in 2024, and to make London a Conservative city again. Thank you. Thank you. Please welcome Member of Parliament for Surrey Heath, Michael Gove. Hello, Wembley. It is wonderful to see so many Conservatives here. It's particularly wonderful to see such a young crowd here tonight. In fact, as I look around, I see thousands of glamorous people who've been treated to some fantastic DJing and who are about to witness great talent on this stage. It almost makes me think I'm back in Ibiza. But don't worry, I won't be dancing tonight. Now this, thank you. Okay, maybe later. Um, um, now we're almost at the very final stage of this leadership election. And um, before I say any more, I just want to, and I'm sure I say this on behalf of all of us, thank one person in particular. Our Prime Minister, Boris Johnson. Let us never forget, and let us make sure the country never forgets, he was the man who delivered Brexit. He was the man who delivered the fastest vaccine rollout in the world. He was the man who stood resolute with Vladimir Zelensky and the brave people of Ukraine when others wobbled and shirked the struggle. So on behalf of all of us, Boris, thank you for your service. And now the time comes to choose. And we have to choose from what has been an enormously impressive field. As Giles Brandreth reminded us earlier, of the eight leadership candidates who made it onto the MP ballot, four for women, four were either immigrants or the children of immigrants. We showed the Conservative Party at its best, open, meritocratic, inclusive. And that means that when we fight the next election and when we fight the next mayoral election, we are the party that looks like London, looks like Britain and is ready to win. <laughs> and now the field is down to two. Two outstanding individuals. I've worked with both Liz and Rishi in government. And I know that both of them are people of talent, people of courage, and that they are people who, deep in their heart, love this country as we do. I know either of them would make a fantastic Prime Minister. And one thing that we need to ensure is that whoever we choose as our next leader and our next Prime Minister, we must, as Ian reminded us earlier, unite behind them in order to defeat Labour.
We cannot let Keir Starmer anywhere now near power. The Corbyn backing, Brexit blocking, tax raising, bandwagging, jumping, apology for a leader should never be anywhere near Downing Street. Now, like many of you, I wanted to make sure that I paid close attention to the arguments that were made in this leadership election between our final two candidates. And I've been so impressed by the way in which they have made their arguments and made their case. And listening to both of them, I felt proud to be a Conservative. But we have to choose. And I have chosen. And I have chosen to support Rishi Sunak as our next Prime Minister. The next two years would be tough for any Prime Minister. Energy prices quadrupling, double-digit inflation, the NHS under pressure, thousands of people illegally arriving on our shores. We need a leader who has courage, who has compassion, and who has conviction. And that is the Rishi that I know. Courage. Rishi was elected to the House of Commons in 2015. Just a few months after he took his place as an MP, he had to make one of the biggest decisions of his life and his career, one of the biggest decisions that any of us had to take, how to vote in that Brexit referendum. There was enormous pressure put on young MPs who'd just come in the House of Commons to vote to remain. Rishi was told that uh, if he voted to leave, that could very well be the end of his career, over before it had started. And I remember talking to Rishi then, and I said, follow your heart, do what you think is right. And he did. He voted for leave. He believed in this country. He has always done the right thing. He always will. Compassion. During the COVID crisis, Rishi had only been chancellor for a few weeks. One of the biggest challenges that any government has had to face. Rishi designed, implemented, and rolled out the furlough scheme. He made sure that businesses survived through those difficult times. He made sure <laughs> that jobs were protected and the vulnerable supported. And that is why the IMF said that his rescue package was undoubtedly the best on the globe at that time. And conviction. In this leadership race, it is vitally important that we tell the truth to each other and we tell the truth to the British public. We face tough economic times. We need to make sure that inflation, the thief in the night, that robs savings and impoverishes us all, is tackled before we then cut taxes. We need to make sure, we need to make sure that as Conservatives, we help the vulnerable at a time of challenge and make sure that the support is targeted in a way that matters. Rishi, throughout his time in government, throughout his time in this campaign, throughout all the years I have known him, has always told the truth. He, he, He is a leader all of us can trust. Courage, conviction, compassion. I'm ready for Rishi, I hope you are too. They say beware the underdog, because an underdog has got nothing to lose. An underdog fights for every inch. They work harder, stay longer, think smarter. 
Underdogs don't give up. They'll do the difficult things, and they never, ever get complacent. So, write them off if you like. Sit back and dismiss them, but if there's one thing I know to be true, it's that Britain loves an underdog. Please welcome... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Wembley. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Wembley. Good evening. The first thing, the first thing I want to do tonight is to thank you. In the last, in the last six weeks, in the last six weeks, I have met tens of thousands of members of our conservative family. And every day, every day, your enthusiasm, your commitment to your communities, your belief in our country has renewed my faith in what we are doing. People ask, people ask about public service. Well, look at this arena tonight. This is public service in action. We should be proud to be members of our Conservative Party. Now, now this, this final hustings is special for me because the two people who inspired me to enter public service are actually here tonight. My mum and dad. Now, now you... You may, you, may, you, may, you may have picked up over the summer that my dad used to be a GP. My mum used to run a chemist where I grew up. But it was their example of service and what they did for people that inspired me to enter politics. Mum, dad, thank you for always sacrificing and striving to provide a better life for your kids than you had. And thank you, and thank you for teaching me that with hard work and belief and the love of your family, that there is no limit to what someone can achieve in our great country. Now, I also wanted to say thank you to my incredible, loving, kind wife, Akshatha. You, you know what you mean to me, and I am incredibly grateful that 18 years ago, you chose to give up your high heels and take a chance on the short kid with a backpack. <laughs> now, right now, our opponents in the Labour Party are sitting at home. They're puzzled. They're asking themselves, why are those Conservatives about to produce Britain's third female Prime Minister or its first non-white Prime Minister. Well, we can tell them.
and we can tell them because in our party we value who you are, not what you are. We, we are not captured, we are not captured by identity politics. We just want the best person to do the job. And because, and it's because we are not captured by identity politics that we can take on and stand up to this woke nonsense that wants to cancel our history, our values, and can't even say what a woman is. Now, leadership elections tend to emphasize difference. But in fact, I agree with Liz on far more than we disagree on. And I don't just mean our shared love for Whitney Houston and Taylor Swift. I was proud to work alongside her closely to put together the most stringent set of sanctions the world had seen so that we could say to Putin, your aggression will not go unpunished and Britain will stand up for freedom and democracy. Liz. Liz is a fantastic foreign secretary. She is a terrific ambassador for our country and we all should pay her an enormous tribute because she is a proud and passionate conservative. <laughs> it's done. We're going to come together and we're going to show the country that it is the conservative party and only the Conservative Party that can provide the leadership that our nation needs. Now, and that leadership, and that leadership starts by being straight with the country about the economic challenges that we face. Now, I've not chosen to say the things that people may want to hear. I've said the things that I believe our country needs to hear. And although it hasn't made my life easy, it is honest, and for me, that is what leadership is all about. Yeah. It's what leadership is all about. For me, in the pandemic, acting decisively to successfully safeguard our economy in the face of the biggest shock we had seen in 300 years. So you know, I have the ability, I have the experience to safely steer us through the storms ahead. And, and my plan, and my plan is the right plan to tackle inflation, to compassionately support those who most need our help and to safeguard our children's economic inheritance, because as Margaret Thatcher and Nigel Lawson knew, maxing out the country's credit card is not right, it's not responsible, and it is certainly not conservative. <laughs> but, weathering, but weathering, just simply weathering the storm is not enough. I want to use my business experience to lead our economy to a brighter future, where we radically reform our taxes so that our businesses are investing more, training more, innovating more, where we seize the opportunities of Brexit to cut red tape and ensure that our economy is the most dynamic in the world. Because unlike Labour, we know, the Conservatives know, that it's the risk taker, the entrepreneur, the small business owner that create jobs and prosperity, and our party will always be on their side. But as your, but as your Prime Minister, I want to do so much more than that. So let me tell you about the better Britain that I want to build for all of us. Starting with our National Health Service, the NHS will always be safe in my hands. But we cannot simply keep throwing money at it. I will be brave enough to actually reform it to get the more efficient health service that we need. And when it comes, 
and when it comes to crime, I will do whatever it takes to ensure that my two young daughters grow up in a society where it is safe for them to walk on the streets at night. So whether, so whether, so whether it is, so whether, whether it is, whether it is using stop or stop and search or tackling the heinous grooming gangs, I will never let political correctness stand in the way of keeping us safe. But our security starts at our borders. And I stand here as the product of our country's proud, compassionate history of welcoming people to our shores. But that migration must be legal. So as your Prime Minister, as your Prime Minister, my message will be simple. If you break the law, if you come here illegally, if you undermine our system, there will be no place for you because it is the fundamental right of our country to protect its borders and that is what I will deliver. Now there are many, there are many proud achievements of the Conservative-led governments over the past 12 years. But for me, the most powerful thing that I believe we have done are the education reforms pioneered by Michael Gove. Yeah. Just look, just look at Brampton Manor Academy, where more children are going to Oxbridge than even Eton or indeed Winchester. Yeah. Or the Michaela School just nearby, whose pupils are getting the best GCSE results in the country. Now that's important. Now that's important because for us as Conservatives, education is the best way that we spread opportunity, the best way that we reduce inequality, indeed the best way that we transform people's lives. And that is why, as your Prime Minister, I will ensure that whether it's our schools or indeed our apprenticeships, under the Conservatives, the birthright of every child will be a world-class education. Yeah. And in conclusion, let me just say something about the conduct of government. I will lead a government that is conducted competently, that is conducted seriously, and with decency and integrity at the heart of everything that we do. That, 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 that is the change that I am going to bring. That is the Prime Minister that I am going to be, and that is how we are gonna win the next general election. And we must do that. We must do that, because if we don't, it won't just be Keir Starmer walking through the door of Downing Street. He'll have Ed Davey, Caroline Lucas, and Nicola Sturgeon with him too. We can't let that happen, and we won't. Now, my, my fellow Conservatives, we put ourselves forward to lead Britain in good times and bad times alike. The public did us the honour of choosing us to do the job. Now let's go and prove them right. Thank you.
and gentlemen, a round of applause for both the candidates and of course for Michael Gove and Ian Duncan Smith and everything you've heard. My goodness me, the energy I asked for, if we're allowed to talk about energy, uh, I asked for energy in the, thank you, some of you are paying attention, energy in the room, we could rival BP, couldn't we, if we wanted to, well done all of you. And now it falls to you, for if I've got my sums right, the third time in a little over six years to make a decision that will affect the whole of the country. Yes, it falls to you to do the job of choosing your next leader and the next prime minister. Three times in six years, they should probably be paying you when you think about it, but that's, <laughs> that's just an idea. And here we find ourselves at the home of football. We've come to Wembley to sort it all out. And you are about to hear, if you listen to the bookies, you're about to hear, ladies and gentlemen, from the undeniable favourite, the Manchester City, if you will, of this competition. But, <laughs> I could hardly say Tottenham, could I? But, maybe next year. But, could there be a 90th minute surprise, an extra time upset? There's only one way to find out. Let's get the first candidate, your Foreign Secretary, Liz Truss. This trust, thank you uh, very much for coming. And while this is obviously a celebration, I have to tell you a few home truths. While you and your colleague have been on a five-week beauty parade, people in this room have seen inflation go to the highest rate for 40 years, energy bills go to nearly 4,000 pounds, wages are down by 4%, mortgages will soar, the NHS doesn't have enough ambulances in some parts of the country, or enough doctors, and bizarrely, despite downpours, I'm not allowed to water my garden. This, this is a zombie government. You're a senior representative. You've done nothing for the last five weeks, have you? Well, I've been working as Foreign Secretary. I think there's some support I, for that idea. I have idea. been working as Foreign Secretary, Nick. And, of course, we face problems, and many of the problems you've talked about, like inflation, are problems that we face as a result of COVID, as a result of the war in Ukraine. I'm proud of what we've done to take on Vladimir Putin to help the Ukrainians fight this war for freedom and democracy. And of course, you know, we need to continue to do that, to end this war, which is partly the reason we're seeing such high energy prices. So the government absolutely is functioning. I am part of that government, but what we're here today to talk about right. is who is the next Prime Minister, which is going to take place within but the next week. To those who say you've perhaps focused a little bit too much on Ukraine and are not enough on Uxbridge, how would you reply? Well, my, my, I'm, I'm the Foreign Secretary, so my job is to focus on key foreign affairs issues, and I've been focusing on delivering, delivering on the Northern Ireland Protocol, so restoring the primacy of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, dealing with the issue perpetrated by Vladimir Putin in Ukraine, and dealing with numerous other foreign affairs issues, and that's my responsibility. And I have but, know, continued to support our Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, in that time. But if in a few days, if, yes, do please, we want as much audience reaction, do, do join in. If, and indeed, of course, uh, uh, the people listening on LBC and the Global Player then can pick up on your reaction because you are all live on the Global Player and you're live on LBC Radio. If you're the Prime Minister in a few days' time, I have to bring you to some domestic matters, though, uh, Liz Truss. You'll be aware that 15 minutes from where we are now, an 87-year-old man was fatally stabbed in his mobility scooter. In Liverpool, a nine-year-old girl was fatally shot in her home. There have been 68 killings in London, an even greater number in Birmingham per capita. You now get mugged in London if you have an expensive watch. Liz Truss, the Conservative Party has gone from being the one of law and order to crime and no punishment, hasn't it? Well, as I, as I mentioned in my speech, Nick, I do think Sadiq Khan has not done enough to combat crime in London. 
and we we have seen we have seen appalling crimes perpetrated we've seen too much focus by the police on issues that don't concern the public and i want our police to spend their time policing our streets we will deliver on the 20,000 new police officers we promised i would introduce league tables so we can compare how forces are doing at delivering on stopping crime. But if you remember, Nick, when the current Prime Minister was Mayor of London, he did a very good job of tackling crime. He did. So we need a Mayor of London who is actually prepared to be tough on crime, and I'm afraid we don't have that in Sadiq Khan. Should, he, should his responsibility involved in policing the metropolis, should that be removed or reviewed? That is to say, the Commissioner reports direct to the Home Sec the Secretary, who reports directly to you. Let's try. Well, I see, I see a lot of support for that because of the identity of the current mayor. But I think when you do have a good mayor, such as Boris Johnson, who is cracking down on crime, I believe, I believe the best decisions are made locally. And you know, one of the points I've been making about the planning system is I don't want to see house building decisions taken in Whitehall. I want to see them taken by local communities. And what we have to do is we have to get Sadiq Khan out of office. That is, that is the way right. that we will deal let, with this let. issue. But what, 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 the, what the government can do is they can provide more information to the public about exactly what isn't happening on and, crime in London. And that's what I would aim to do through league tables. And just moving you a little bit out of London, because there's a chance that people could have come here from Hertfordshire and Essex and Kent and elsewhere. Do you support the... I've got some, one of them right. Do you support <laughs> the idea... I haven't got time to do each one. Do you support the idea of local police commissioners? I do. I support the what idea of, of police and crime commissioners. Well, I think it varies from area to area, but I've seen the impact in Norfolk of our police and crime commissioner. It's positive. And people know who they are before... We had these uh, police and crime, I think they were called boards, but nobody knew who they were. So I do support direct elections for police and crime commissioners. I think they're a good All thing. Right. But what we need is much more transparency about what the police are actually delivering right, and how they're performing compared to other forces. And we had the same situation in schools. In the 1980s, there were just rumours about whether schools were good or bad. You know, we didn't have league tables. We didn't know how kids were performing in their... O levels or GCSEs. Now we have league tables, people know exactly how good their school is. I think we need the same for the police. One final question on crime, Liz Truss. Are you in favour? Are you in favour of police officers dancing the Macarena, taking the knee and painting their fingernails? That's male officers. <laughs> well, their priority should be fighting crime and dealing with the issue. They can dance the Macarena in their spare time. And Liz Truss said they can dance the Macarena in their spare time. Let's move on to the energy crisis. We must talk about this. If you are Prime Minister next week, Liz Truss, you'll know this cap has gone from, I'll give the figures again, someone says when, £1,971 to £3,549. Some estimates say it's headed towards 6000 In practical terms, what do you plan to do where you, are you if you're there next week? So, first of all, I will make sure we're not taking money from people in tax and then giving it back to them in handouts. Ah, can you so my first, my first approach will be to reduce, to reverse the national insurance increase, not have, have a temporary moratorium on the green energy levy, so people immediately see reductions in their fuel bills. My second priority is increasing the supply of energy to the UK. The fact is, we should have made decisions years ago about nuclear power. We should be using more of the resources in the North Sea. Uh, we should be doing fracking in areas where local communities support it. And we should be, we should be moving forward to secure our supply. Okay. And I'm afraid, by successive governments, there have been too much short-term decisions that have left Britain dependent on the global energy price. Okay. And because of the war in Ukraine, and it's vital we end that war, and ending that war will, of course, help alleviate this situation, the United Kingdom has been exposed to global energy prices. So dealing with supply 
is the second thing I would do. And the third thing, of course, and this would be a matter for the Chancellor in the budget or fiscal event or whatever people like to call it, the, well, what that would be well a fiscal event is a budget so okay. anyway in a fiscal event right. the, the chancellor would address the issue of household support would you cut VAT from 20 to 15 percent I am not going to predict what a putative chancellor I'm not ruling things in and out I'm not sitting here writing a is, future budget or fiscal is event is VAT too high currently that's, you're just asking the same question in a you're different right. way. Okay. Let me ask you something else. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely I know, right. Nick, I know your tricks. Yeah. I know your tricks. In, um, in 2019, listeners to my LBC show heard one Boris Johnson say, there will be no new taxes, read my lips. Can you say tonight, read my lips, no new taxes on your administration, please? Yes. No new taxes. No new taxes. I mentioned, I mentioned Boris Johnson. Recently, he had the worst approval rating since the Second World War for a British Prime Minister. But last week, in a poll of Tory supporters, he scored 49% and you scored 18. <laughs> what does that say about you, Liz Truss? Well, I believe that with hindsight, Boris Johnson will be viewed as a hugely consequential Prime Minister for our country. He delivered, he delivered Brexit, he delivered the vaccine, and he also delivered on standing up to Vladimir Putin and supporting the Ukrainians. As, as far as I'm aware, there are no other world leaders with a croissant named after them in Kyiv and a street named after them. And, you know, I, I was Boris's first cabinet supporter when he ran to be leader. I was proud to serve in his cabinet. I did not support uh, the various shenanigans that went on. No. But the reality okay. is, Nick, we are where we are. Okay. And you... I'm a person who believes in dealing with the here and now. All right. And I'm not you know, a, great, a great person for you... looking, looking backwards. You, you, you mentioned um, world leaders. You, you've mentioned some other well-known political figures on the campaign. Nicola Sturgeon is an attention seeker. Mark Drakeford, Mark, Mark Drakeford is, the, is the low energy version of Jeremy Corbyn. This is Liz Truss's words. Yeah, I, uh, Macron, I still agree with myself. The, the, the jury is out on, the jury is out on whether Monsieur Macron is friend or foe. Is, is Donald Trump friend or foe? Look, <laughs> I'm not. I am not going to comment on Well, you're happy to political... comment about all the others. Well, I, I didn't comment on Macron, actually. I said that... Um... You said the jury's out. Well, that's so... not commenting as far as well, I can, let me as refer... far as I can say. And, return you, you to know, my let question. Me, let, Trump, let, friend or foe? Look, I am not going to comment on future, future potential presidential runners. We have to work with who is in the White House. The United States is our closest ally. I have met both President Trump when he was in office and President Biden, now he's in office. And my priority is working to promote freedom and democracy around the world and to work with our American right. allies against what are okay. some very severe threats we're facing, well, including an assertive China, ah. a belligerent Russia. You know, ah. that, that is my priority. So and, I and both the United States and France are freedom-loving democracies, and I will work with both of them, whoever the leader is. Then I can take from that... <laughs> then I can take from that that President Xi is a foe. Well, what, what I would say well, about China... You assertive China, so he must be a foe. No, I'm not going to use the word foe, but what I will say is I am concerned about China's assertiveness. I do not believe that as a country, we should become strategically dependent on China. I am working with our G7 allies to make sure that we build up our links with fellow freedom-loving democracies so we don't end up in the same position we were in with Russia, 
which is dependent on an authoritarian regime. All right. That is what I'm concerned are... about. I, um, I want to tell everyone here and the audience on LBC, I've only got two more minutes uh, with this trust, so let me move to my final couple of questions. If in a few days' time you move into number 10, waiting for, all right, waiting, waiting for you... No complacency here, Waiting for you is a £3,675 drinks trolley, a £7,000 rug, £2,250 pounds worth of gold wallpaper. Are they all staying? Well, it sounds like you've, you've been to the number 10 flat, Nick. I have not been to the number 10 flat, and irrespective of whether I had or not, I ask you again, the rug, the drinks trolley. Oh, and I can also do you a kitchen tablecloth for £500. Will, yes, £500. Will they be staying? Well, all, all I can tell you, Nick, is first of all, I am from Yorkshire. So I do believe in value for money and not buying new things if you've already got things that are perfectly good to use. And, and secondly, secondly, I think with the, with the in-tray of issues that you've outlined earlier, I don't think I'm going to have time to think about the wallpaper or right. the flooring. And finally, <laughs> you will have time to, th if you are successful, I know you want to say when, if you will have time to think, will you be happy being driven around in an Audi, a German car, rather than a British Jaguar, because apparently we can't make one for next year? Well, will, I, you drive it? Will, you, will you be driven in an Audi? Look, I know, because, because in my current job as Foreign Secretary, I have police protection, and ultimately it is a decision for the police about the best car to use we'll in the circumstances. Just use for another year. Well, look, I, I, will, I will look into this issue in more detail, but Ooh. fundamentally, Ooh. fundamentally... Well, look, I'm not... I am going to focus... What would be wrong with using the Jag for 12 more months while they build you another one and tell Germany well, maybe, to use their Audi? Maybe, maybe I'll employ you as my car consultant. But if I am, if I am, if I am given the honour of becoming our Prime Minister, I will be focusing on energy prices for consumers, how we get the British economy going, and how we deal with queues in the National Health Service. I will not be focusing on the car I'm in. Before we go to your questions, your appreciation for Liz Trust, please, everybody. Thank you. And now... Are we standing up for questions? No, I think you can sit. Oh, we're going to sit down for sit. questions. And okay. I'm going to point you in the right direction. That's the plan. OK, everyone. OK. <laughs> All righty. The only... OK, the only slight issue... I love your energy, but I can't hear what I'm being told. But anyway, let's see. We're going to the first question. Daniel in the City of London, hopefully this way. Daniel? This way. Daniel? This way. This way. Daniel? Over here, Daniel. Here we go. Daniel, over there, sir. Thanks, uh, David from the City of London. That would be David from the City of London. <laughs> um, well, I'll be going then. Thanks very much indeed. Congratulations. <laughs> Uh, hi Liz, um, so I'm a business owner in the City of London and currently the energy price cap only applies to households and not businesses. Many businesses are suffering the rapid increase in energy costs. How will you ensure that all businesses and ultimately all our high streets can survive the cost of energy crisis? Liz Truss. Well, first of all, I would run an unashamedly pro-business government. That is why, that is why... I would keep corporation tax low, I'd reverse the national insurance rise, and I'd make sure that we are not putting undue regulations on business. And what we're also doing is unleashing investment by things like solvency, changing solvency two, and so on. On energy, in the answer I gave to Nick earlier, you'll have heard me talking about supply of energy. And that's why I think dealing with supply is the answer to this problem. Because you're right, it's not just a problem for people, it's a problem for businesses with high energy costs. So I'll be looking across the board to make sure we're increasing supply and therefore dealing with the root cause of the issue rather than just putting a sticking plaster on. But I would absolutely be looking to act on business energy costs. Thank you for that. Just, just a quick one. 
You'll be aware in France they talked about the possibility of energy rationing. Can you rule that out, Liz Truss? I do rule that out, yes. You rule out energy rationing, okay. <laughs> Tony in Knightsbridge, right ahead of you there, in a blue, oh, in, in a ready for Rishi shirt. This should be good. I go think, ahead. I think he's biased, Nick. He's biased. <laughs> Here we go. Let's see how we go. Okay, um, Truss. could you just comment on your attitude to helping Israel in the event it was attacked by another country? Liz Truss. Well, I, I am a huge supporter of Israel. Secretary, I have signed a strategic cooperation agreement with Yair Lapid, who was the Foreign Minister, now the Prime Minister of Israel. I have changed our position on the Human Rights Council at the United Nations to back Israel against some of the motions that were being put forward by other countries. And we will always stand with Israel and will work very closely with our allies to make sure Israel is safe. The number one priority has to be stopping Iran getting a nuclear weapon. And I'm absolutely focused on that. Thank you. We have a question from Morley. Morley is here somewhere, Morley. Hi, it's Morley and I'm from Broadland. Um, Can you so... wave at us, Morley? We can't quite see you. Where are Okay, right Hello. up there. Okay, up there. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I'm all the way from Broadland in Norfolk and I am their Youth Association Chair. Um, so, we've heard a lot about saving our democracy, fighting for our freedom and fighting this left-wing bias. Now, linking those three points together, and I'm sure every member in this audience tonight will agree with me that we need to stop pushing this ludicrous left-wing nonsense onto our children and it's being preached to our youth. <laughs> And, and Liz, what are you going to do to fight for our freedom in education? Because as, a youth, as part of our youth, and I know that this needs to change from experience, what are you going to do? Well, Thank you. M Morley, can I just ask on a point of clarification, the left-wing nonsense, as you call it, can I just get a little more elaboration, just a couple of examples that Liz Truss can tackle and the well, LBC audience? Well, we shouldn't be telling our children that a trans woman is a woman. And we are being taught this in schools and it is not okay. All right. Thank you. Liz Truss, um, I have to ask you, is a trans woman a woman? No. I just said, I just said earlier, a woman is a woman. Now I believe in treating transgender people with respect. I think that's important, but we should not, you know, confuse that with being clear in our language and you know some of the nonsense that has emanated such as chest feeding uh, which we hear from the National Health Service you know we've we've got to be talking in language that is clear and people understand across the country and just on Morley's question you know, frankly left-wing stuff being peddled in schools is not new well, I grew up in Leeds in the 1980s and 90s, and I had plenty of teachers who were preaching about, you know, criticising Mrs Thatcher and preaching about all kinds of things. But I think what's happened more recently is it's become an orthodoxy. And this is what I mean about being proud to be conservatives. We have to fight the battle of ideas, and we have to stand up against this orthodoxy. Of course, as Prime Minister, I will make sure that that is the case in the public sector. But there's a broader cultural issue in our society about standing up against some of this identity politics. And fundamentally, I believe we should value people for their talents, their skills, their hard work, their character. We shouldn't value people because they're a woman or because they're a man or because they're transgender or not. And that yeah. is, the, that is I, the policies the Labour Party are peddling. Yeah, a couple and of... And the left are peddling. OK. A couple of months ago... But we, we have to fight it. OK. We have to fight it. Absolutely. OK. A couple of months ago, I famously asked Sir Keir Starmer whether a woman could have a penis. He's still working out his response. I don't... <laughs> I don't think I dare ask you somehow, so let's move instead. <laughs> Uh, David is to my left. David, sir. Smart motorways kill. They also cause long delays because they close lanes off when there's a breakdown, which is a problem for people who have to drive as part of their job. They also often impose very low speed limits, mandatory ones, much lower than necessary. So will you restore hard shoulders to all motorways? And in the meantime, 
will you change the speed limit from mandatory to advisory to allow people the freedom to judge, <laughs> make their own judge, to allow drivers to make their own judgment, the freedom, freedom to make their own judgment as to what is a safe speed rather than having some uh, overcautious man in a remote box sets the speed limit for them. Okay, in context, campaigners claim, thank you very much, David, campaigners claim 75 lives have been mm. lost on these so-called smart motorways and there are four coroners in England and Wales who've requested a review. Liz Truss. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I absolutely think that we need to review them and stop them if they are not working as soon as possible. And all the evidence I have agrees with the point you're making on smart motorways and on speed limits again i would be prepared to look at that i can't give you a precise answer on the point but i do i do believe that the smart motorways experiment hasn't worked so you and in would fact stop, has been just for clarification you would stop them yes you would stop smart motorways okay thank you for, thank you very much indeed we are now and i sense there's a lot of support we are looking for Daniel in Guildford. Daniel in Guildford, please wave at... Ah, here we go, behind, here we go, sir. Thank you. Hi, Liz. Oh, you're Daniel. Right, we've got Hi, you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, for years and years, multinational corporations have been avoiding uh, billions and billions of ta in, in taxes that they owe to this country. Uh, for an example, in 2021, Apple's UK division paid just £800,000 in tax, despite making almost 971 million. How are you gonna close these loopholes so that we get our fair share of tax from everyone? And thank you, and of course I just need to say, I, I must just say here for the listeners to LBC and the viewers and of course Global Player that there's no suggestion this is just exploring tax opportunities rather than anything that breaks the law. I have to get out there because my bosses would be nervous otherwise. Liz Truss. So one of the problems we have with our tax system is it's far too complicated. And actually, the more complicated a system is, the more it allows loopholes to emerge. So what I would do is, as well as making the immediate changes to tax, reversing national insurance, keeping corporation tax low, is have a full review of our tax system, looking at areas like business rates, looking at making sure tax is fair for families, because at the moment, we have one of the least pro-family tax systems in the, you know, in the modern world. And also looking at how we have a simpler system so there are fewer loopholes that can be exploited. But, but what I worry about is what's happened is it's a bit, been a bit like a Christmas tree, our tax system. We find we, we create new tax bans, we create new taxes. Companies find a way to... What was the word you were... Circumvent or circumvent explore them. Well, tax you see, he's, he's got the legally yeah. right words well, there. Well, I read about that. Uh, and and actually, right. we just end up hiring more and more people at HMRC to chase these companies up. And the solution is a simpler tax system that's fair for everyone. OK. And... <laughs> Treasury figures reported last week suggested that over the next 10 years, energy companies, again, no tax issue here, but are going to be making tens of billions of pounds of profits. Would you revisit the idea of another windfall tax, Liz Truss? No. No more windfall tax, okay. Andy is in West Acton. And hello, sir. Blue Hi. shirt, red tie. Hi, Liz. Um, as, as a British Ukrainian, um, I'm truly... Um, <laughs> Thank you. Um, I am truly inspired and grateful to Boris Johnson and the British government for all the support you've been providing Ukraine people. The war um, continues and uh, Putin's army is continuing to butcher innocent women and children. When you become prime minister, in the short term, what specific measures will you take in specifically providing uh, multiple launch rocket systems to Ukraine? Thank you. Well, first of all, I mean, you and your countrymen are an inspiration to the world. And, you know, I, I feel very strongly that you are, you are fighting for freedom and democracy, not just for your own country, but for the whole of Europe. And we owe it to you to do all we can to support you. And, you know, I, I am proud that we were the first European country to send weapons to Ukraine. You know, we are training up uh, Ukrainian soldiers. We continue to send weapons. 
and we continue to work with our allies around the world. And you're right about the multiple launch rocket systems. Ukraine needs more of them. You need more heavy weapons to be able to uh, fight the Russians effectively. And as Foreign Secretary, I have done all I can to work with my colleague Ben Wallace to make sure you've got that support, but also to encourage our allies to provide that support as well. And some people say, uh, and we also need to put more sanctions on. That's absolutely clear. We need to do more to cut off Putin's supply of revenue that he is using to perpetrate the war in Ukraine. But the people who say that this costs too much are completely wrong because the cost of doing nothing is much, much worse. Because I believe that Putin, Putin will not stop. He would not stop at Ukraine. You know, he will go into Eastern Europe and threaten global security. And it also sends a signal, frankly, for other authoritarian regimes around the world about what is or isn't acceptable. This is why it is strategically vital that Putin is defeated in Ukraine. I think, I think I read that if you are successful, President Zelensky would be your first overseas call. Is that correct? Yes. Why would that be? Tradition, and again, a lot of support. Why would that be? Why would it not be, say, President Biden? And when do you think you'd be able to make your first trip to Kyiv? Well, I'm not going to uh, sort of go into a potential diary uh, no, no. at this stage because... Uh, it's, always, kind of year, it's always dangerous to, <laughs> to, to predict things in advance, but President Zelensky is an inspiration. And what I want to show the Ukrainians is that they will continue to get the United Kingdom's full support. And I know how important it is to President Zelensky and how important it is to the Ukrainian government. And that is why I would aim to do it as early as possible to demonstrate that commitment. This, this calendar year, if you can. Well, I, as soon as possible okay. is what I will say it's next. It's the final question from the floor, I'm afraid, Liz Truss. We go behind you a little bit. Uh, Moody, I understand, in Watford. Moody. Hi, Hello. good evening, guys. Hello. So I run a childcare nursery in London. England has some of the tightest childcare ratios in Europe. We've got the third highest childcare costs in the developed world. Would you be bold and brave and think about reducing the childcare ratios for England? And would you consider scrapping business rates for nurseries in line with Scotland? Well, Moody, it's, it's very, very good to hear from you. And I will certainly make sure that if I'm successful, I'm in touch with you about your ideas about what we can do. To, to, but it to give is you a, some background, it is do, a priority. Do, you, do you know what the ratio is for young children? Well, I, I know all this because I was childcare minister. So for two years. And I tried to pursue those reforms. So for two And they were kiboshed by Nick Clegg. Okay. Who has run away to California because he doesn't, doesn't want to face what's going on here in Britain. So you know that for two year olds, it is one adult to. I think it's three or four children. Four. four. It's one to four. What would you seek to take that to? I'm not going to go into the details of the policy. And anyone who's interested can see what I was proposing when I was childcare minister back when Nick Clegg blocked the reforms. But what I'm absolutely clear about is childcare is too expensive for parents across our country. We do need to reform the way we do things. We need to also reform the government funding because currently it comes from three different departments, Treasury, DWP, DFE, and it would be an absolute priority for me to help the brilliant people who work in nurseries, but also help parents who are struggling with the cost of living. Okay, just to finally then, if, um, <laughs> if, if when you make your first trip to the White House, both Nick Clegg and Donald Trump ask to take you for a cocktail. <laughs> oh my God, what a choice. Yeah, who, <laughs> with whom would you share your cocktail? Well, I think I'd focus on meeting President Biden. All right. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, your appreciation for your candidate you. and your foreign secretary, Liz Truss.
the book is and the commentariat again, my friends. Now, if you go by that, of course, your next person you're going to hear from is possibly out of touch, but we know how the commentariat and the bookies have done before. Do you remember when we were told that Neil Kinnock was going to be our Prime Minister? The Red Wall would still be in place, and we know what happened there. So here, possibly, to deliver that extra time winner or change of pace or to change the whole story, and remember listening to us on LBC and Global Player, your other candidate, your appreciation, please, Mr. Rishi Sunak. Good to see you again, uh, Mr. Sunak. Can I refer you to today's Financial Times? Mm. You have an interview in which you say, you warn, it would be, quotes, complacent and irresponsible to ignore the risk of markets losing confidence in the British economy. Are you saying that that could come about if Liz Truss were the Prime Minister? No, I, I was saying any Chancellor, any Prime Minister should not be complacent about those risks because you know, we, we currently have a very large amount of debt a lot of that debt is very much like a floating rate mortgage. So as inflation moves, a large amount of our interest payments also move at the same time. That's a risk that we have that other countries don't have to the same degree. And similarly, uh, again, people may not know this, but compared to most other countries, we rely far more on foreign investors to finance our deficits in this country. A former central bank governor actually called it relying on the kindness of strangers. This is Mark Carney. Yeah, 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 indeed. So, uh, so, so the thing that anyone but, who wants this job or is thinking about running our economy needs to be cognizant of is that their economic plan, their plan for our borrowing and spending is one which will continue to command the confidence of the markets. And quite frankly, so, that's the right conservative approach because that's a responsible management of the British economy. So, so. So, so just give my, uh, the listeners on LBC, the viewers on Global Player, your, your, your party members here, what would represent complacent and irresponsible behaviour? What are you getting at? What do you fear? But, but, but it comes down to borrowing. It comes down to the markets having confidence that the trajectory of our public finances is one that they have confidence in. that we're not constantly just going to be borrowing money that we have no hope of paying back. That is a, a pretty standard tenet of what anyone who's investing in the UK and right. buying our debt would like to see. And, and that's why having a, a credible plan is important. As I said, that's, that's what the Conservative Party's always stood for, and it's what it will stand for under my leadership. Your, your, your rival, Liz Truss, uh, has just ruled out any more windfall taxes and ruled out energy rationing this winter as France is considering. Can you do the same? So I introduced a windfall tax as Chancellor yes. and I'm glad that I did Would because you it, it was the right thing to do. Uh, so, uh, and look, I, and I, look I, I, don't, I don't actually know if, if Liz supports it or doesn't support it, but I think it is absolutely the right thing at a time when energy companies are making billions of pounds of profits because of a war that that's not right, right. and we so, should exceptionally tax those and help so, use those for people's bills. And certainly support in the room. I take um, from that you would be prepared to do it again. And, I, and I, well, I, we've got it in place, okay. but uh, as I said, it, okay. I think it, in the situation and, that we're in, it was the right thing to do, and I'm and, glad I did it, okay. quite frankly. And, and I think your, your listeners probably all agree. Yes, and energy rationing? Uh, we, we shouldn't rule anything out, because the challenges oh. that we face at the, with this crisis are significant all right. and as many European countries are looking at how we can all optimize our energy usage that is a sensible thing for us to be doing as a country because whether it's improving the energy efficiency of our homes changing how our boilers work right. the um, why is inflation here so high an organization called Goldman Sachs I think you know it well is <laughs> is suggesting that inflation could reach 22.4%. We're currently at 10.1. France at 6.8, Spain at 10.4, Germany at 8.8, the US at 8.5. Can you give us an assurance that inflation won't rise under you, and why is it so much higher anyway? 
No. Uh, well, it's, uh, I spoke about this as Chancellor. It's, it's particularly high here for two reasons. One is the mix of our energy is different to many other countries. So the more dependent you are on natural gas, for example, the, the more that you have the inflationary impact. That's what we're seeing. But the second thing that we have here that most European countries don't have is tightness in our labor market. Now, many people here will be running businesses because it's a fantastic conservative audience of small business owners. And other than energy bills, the thing that probably is the biggest challenge is finding workers, and it has been for a while. And that labor inflation is something that we are experiencing that the rest of Europe is not. So those are two significant reasons. Now, look, I, I can't give you a guarantee that it's going to fall straight away. I think this is the biggest challenge that we face. But what I can guarantee you is that given that I have consistently said that inflation is the number one priority facing our country. It will be my number one priority. I've been saying that since the beginning of this campaign. I can guarantee that it will fall far faster with my plan than it will with anyone else's. You, Mr. Sunak, Mr. Sunak, you are nothing if not a numbers man. Can I share some more with you? We go back about four years when Sajid Javid, the then Home Secretary, cut his holiday short because 300 migrants had made the crossing in one month. 300 in one month. You'll be aware that last week, 1,295 souls made the crossing on one day. We spend £4.75 million a day in hotel costs for these people. What would you do about it? Well, Nick, I, I mentioned it in my speech for a reason, because I, I think it's one of the emergencies that our country Didn't faces. Detail, respect yeah, so, well, in the interest of time, those who are particularly interested in this, there is a detailed 10-point plan on my give website. Give me the top three. So I'll give, I'll give you the top, well, I'll give you the top two, why don't okay. we do that in the interest right. of time. I think the first thing, we very quickly need to move away from the European definition of asylum, because it is far too broad and it is exploited by everybody. And there are different international... There are different international standards that we can use. A second thing uh, is that we need to toughen up our foreign policy, because at the moment, me, we might well be talking to a country about a trade deal that we want to do with them. We may even be giving them overseas aid, but we don't at the same time insist that they must take back their failed asylum seekers. Now, I think that's wrong, and we should change that, and that will help. Can you... Can you give my listeners and, and your members here a, a, a promise it would never hit 1,295 per day again under you? No, what I can say is with my plan, I'm confident that we can get a grip of it, but it is not going to be easy. It's going to require us to be bold, and I'm prepared. What I can tell your listeners is I'm prepared to do whatever it takes, legal changes as required, to make the, the Rwanda policy work, to follow through on my 10-point plan, because as I said in my speech, it is the fundamental right of a country to have proper control of its borders, and that's what I will deliver as Prime Minister. How has Priti Patel performed in her role as Home Secretary? Well, I mean, Priti deserves uh, enormous credit for implementing the Rwanda plan and the, job, and the job well, of I'm the sorry. new Prime Minister. Uh, and, and the job of the new Prime Minister will be to make sure that that plan actually can be worked. And but that's Mr. what we will need to do. Mr Sunak, she takes credit for implementing the Rwanda... It hasn't been implemented. I, I said so we, we have just put it in place. The job but of the no new Prime Minister left. will be to put it in to actually make sure that we can get it to work. And that will require I mean, Boris Johnson changes. and Prince Charles have been to Rwanda, but no one else. We haven't been able to get anyone else there. <laughs> <laughs> that's the reality. Yes. And look, it was always going to be... won't work, will well, it? It, it? No, no, it can work. But it was always going to be the case that we were going to face legal challenges on that plan. That was always going to be the case. That was not, it's, not a, it's not a new thing that that's happened. But that's why I said very specifically that I will do whatever it right. takes, legal changes as required, to make that plan work, because it is the right plan. 100 quid, bet with me, money going to Conservative Party funds, not one person goes to Rwanda in the first six months of your term. No, oh gosh, I mean, it's not, I mean, we don't need the money for your party. But what we need months. to do, what we need to do is make the plan work, right? So... OK. Will Priti Patel be Home Secretary? I, I, it's not right for me to comment on people's jobs. Would you Nick? wish to retain her service? Again, that wouldn't be right for me to comment on anyone's jobs. Right. I mean, that's a bizarre thing to ask, right? What I can say I is... I don't know respect, it's not a bizarre thing It is, it is. It actually it is. I mean, it, it really is. 
I, I think, right. I think that's not I, what I, I think. I don't know why it's bizarre to ask no, you. No, no, okay. it is. It's not appropriate. It's, can it's, I, com it's definitely can not appropriate. But I'd say, look, I, I've got in, enormous... I've been a colleague of Pretty's for the time I've been okay. in government, and she's done a, a terrific job under very difficult circumstances, and I've got nothing but admiration okay. for her. Can, can I share one last set of statistics with you, which would very much uh, cross your brief as PM and whoever is Home Secretary? I probably don't need to know you with crime. It's at the highest rate in England and Wales for some 20 years. And another worrying statistic, the percentage of crimes resulting in a charge or a summons is at 5.6%. That is the lowest since records began. In London, you can't even wear a smart watch without fear you'll be robbed. What would you do? Yeah, uh, so, I mean, particularly in London, this has become intolerable, and right for everyone here, uh, having the anxiety that if you're trying to work, walk home from the tube at night, particularly if you're a young woman, uh, that is something that's wrong. And I think the first thing we need to do is to squarely hold to account the failings of Sadiq Khan, because on his watch, <laughs> right, if you, if you just, if you look at the record, there, there's, no, there's, nothing, there's nothing inevitable about this. If you look at the record of the previous administration, led by one Boris Johnson and indeed the policing uh, deputy mayor, Kit Malthouse. I don't, know if, I don't know if Kit's here, but you know, under, under their leadership, I think the murder rate in London halved and violent crime fell by a quarter. So, and they've showed that it is absolutely possible to do it. If you are prepared, as a mayor, to actually go and do the right things. What, be what tough. should Mayor Khan be doing that he's not doing so, again? What they, I mean, so give me one example is stop and search, right? And I mentioned it in my speech, right? Like, and I said, it, it's an effective, it's an effective policing tactic. It's an effective policing tactic. And I was saying this actually, by the way, up in Manchester, the same problem. Got a Labour mayor, Labour police and crime commissioner, commissioners, the, the, the police force is in special measures. And why? Because th these people are interested, in, more interested in, you know, over there it's about getting, you know, people to make it easier for them to take illegal drugs. And here he's more interested in banning pizza advertising on the tube. And what he should be doing is actually getting the police to fight crime, right? It's not... So There is, there is a school of thought that the mayor should be relieved of responsibility for policing. That is to say the commissioner reports directly to the Home Secretary who would report to the PM. So the mayor is as, would you support that? No, well, I think, look, we, we, the, the job that we have to do is just replace the mayor, right? We have to win the election and replace the mayor. That's a way to solve this problem. Uh, but... Look, we, we, look we, we can play our part in central government as well, right? And, that, and if you, one of the things I want to look at is sentencing. And that, the reason is, actually, and if, if you look at it, if you look at it, actually, people may not know this, but over half of all the convictions in our country are caused by just a very small number of criminals. Less than 9% of criminals account for over half of our convictions. These career criminals, on average, have 19 convictions, 19. Now, I've said, we are a compassionate party. We believe in giving people a second chance, maybe even a third chance, but not a 19th chance. Okay. So we do need to look at sentencing for those career criminals. Lastly, <laughs> lastly on policing, can I, can I just suggest you make it sound a little bit simple by just changing the mayor. The Met is in special measures, as you'll be aware. That is how poorly the Met is performing. It's not as simple as a change of mayor, is it? Well, I mean, ultimately, he is responsible for policing well, alongside the mayor and the accountable mission. for that in the capital. So I'm highly confident if we get a conservative mayor in and change it, because the last time we had a conservative mayor in London, what happened? Crime fell. Murder rates fell. That's what you get with a conservative government and okay. a conservative okay. mayor. Let's talk about... We move away from London to central government. Uh, while you and Ms Truss have been touring the country, you, you might be aware that the Labour Party have picked up a 13-point lead currently. You, or whoever's the PM, are seeking to make history with a fourth consecutive Conservative term. People around here will be knocking on doors and doing whatever they can to try and bring that about. Give me an idea of the amount of damage this has done to the party, the length of this election process. Well, I think, I think it's right that we have a debate about the ideas because it's an important time in our country. And as I said at the beginning, you know, as I've been going around the country meeting thousands of members, I've been incredibly heartened by the debate, the passion, but, the energy with which all the of Labour you have brought winning. to this debate. But I'm very confident that come Monday, as I said, come Monday, we, we will come together Does and we will get focused on serving the country and taking the fight to Sadiq Khan and Keir Starmer because that's the opposition would, and that's what we're going to be united in doing.
would you... Final, I think it's a final question from me, Mr. Sunak. Would you, as Prime Minister, would you seek a conversation with whoever you could at the 1922 committee never to allow a leadership to go this election to go this long again? <laughs> well, I, the, I uh, there might be some support in the room. Yeah. <laughs> well, not if we cut it before we got to this point, Nick. That wouldn't have been good. No, look, I, I think it's absolutely right that we reflect on the process when it's finished as a party, and I'm sure that's something that both right. the 1922 I, and the chairman will want to do, because we should always learn the lessons on it. I think actually probably everyone in the room will have a reflection on the TV debates, and actually is there a way we could have done those differently or better? And I think that's something that I would also urge the party to have look at. All right, I have actually been advised I do have a fight. Well, I think that's been addressed before, but thank you. That was a comment about Boris Johnson. Now let's go on to another one. You have given an interview for The Spectator where you said you were concerned that there was too much almost bullying during the COVID per period or process, Do which has support, to which Dominic Cummings responded, you, Mr. Sunak, are talking dangerous rubbish and your interview reads like a man whose epically bad campaign has melted his brain and he's about to quit politics. <laughs> what, would you, what would you like to say, uh, or send him a note if he can read it, what, what would you like to say uh, to Mr Cummings? Well, I think, I think that will deal with all the people who thought he was secretly running my campaign at the beginning. So, uh... Ladies and gentlemen, your appreciation for your other candidate, Rishi Sunak. Right, yeah, no, perfect. Yeah, I'm going I'm, I'm to stand up, though. Over there. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Okay. What have you got? I've just let this die down, then we'll go. I can't actually hear at the minute. <laughs> okay. Let's. Let's, let's. Thank you. All thank right. you. Right. Okay. Right. I'm gonna. Let's go to our first question. Our first question, Mr. Sir. I think is it Saroop, Sir, Is or Madam Saroop in Westminster? Where are you? Someone waving up there. Yes. Is that they're waving at you? Go ahead. Oh yes, they yeah. are. The chap in the white vest. Yes. Your question. Hi, uh, Saroop. Uh, I had the pleasure to meet you, Rishi, twice in the last uh, week and a half, uh, now three times. Um, uh, my question is uh, about, and I think this is something that distinguishes you uh, in this race, <laughs> it's about ethics and integrity. Uh, now, I would say uh, I quite like Boris, but I think, yeah, I think it was a little bit hard done by him. Um, but I think the issue of ethics and integrity partially brought down the last administration. So my question is, how will you ensure that your government is the beacon of integrity and ethics? Yeah. Thank, you. Thank, thank you, Surit, for the, for the question. It's a great place to start. And look, actually, someone was shouting out about Boris before and, and me leaving. Look, it wasn't an easy reason it was an easy decision for me to... I think they were a bit more disobliging than that about you. Well, anyway, I think they were. We'll, we'll take yeah, it as that. Yeah. I'll be polite back. Yeah. Uh, I but, certainly uh, heard so that. It, was, it wasn't an easy decision for me to make. It, it was a sad decision. But ultimately, as well as our differences on the economy, I found the government was on the wrong side of uh, an ethical issue that I personally couldn't defend. And that's why I left. And, and actually, as it turned out, as it, as it turned out, 60 other members of the government also decided to leave because they thought that it wasn't working. And I think that's why your question is right, because that was a problem and it needs to be changed. And that's why I've put restoring trust at the heart of my campaign and to be your leader. Do you, ju just in a sentence, to but, pick up on what Sarut said, do you think Boris Johnson was, quotes hard done by, Mr Sunak? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think it's been, a, it's been a very difficult period. I worked with him closely for two years and it was very difficult. But what I would say is, when it comes to these ethical issues, we, we can't constantly be on the wrong side of them. The new leader has to set clear direction from the top. I would reappoint an independent ethics advisor because I think that will send a strong signal that these things matter. Uh, uh, Christy in Birmingham. Christy in Birmingham. Um, hello. I'd like to Hi, ask, Christy. Um, what is the greatest sacrifice that you have made to reach the position that you're in now? Wow. Um, oh, perhaps I, how this shows your suitability to be Prime Minister. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I, I mean, that's just very, very straightforward. I mean, the greatest sacrifice I've made is I have been an appalling husband and father 
for the past couple of years. It's as simple as that. And I, you know, my wife, my wife is there. And, uh, I, and that is something that I, is really hard for me because I love my kids to bits, I love my wife to bits, and unfortunately I have not been able to be as present in their lives at all for the past few years as I would like to have been. But that's because I believe that it's an enormous privilege to have these jobs. I care passionately about our country and think I can offer something that will benefit millions of people. That's why I do it, and I'm really blessed to have their support as I do. But, I mean... I am um, candidly, if you're PM, it's not going to get a lot better for a few no, years. No, gosh, it's is not. It? No, but I yeah. said this is great privilege. They, That's they why accept I'm here. It. Okay. Yeah. All right. I think it's Ahmed. Is it here, sir? Blue shirt. Hi, hi, Rishi. Uh, hi. Nice to see you again. Uh, I'm Dr. Ahmed. I'm working as a uh, oldest psychiatrist in Hertfordshire. My question is regarding NHS. NHS has been a you know uh, topic for uh, you know for a lot of politicians in the past. Are you going to consider it as a, you know, as a political agenda for in the coming years, or are you going to resolve the main issues? I'm talking about the retention and recruitment of medical staff, including doctors and nurses, and are you going to put more funding in NHS? Thank you. Yeah. Well, look, I, th thank you. Look, the NHS is unquestionably the country's number one public service priority. So the first thing we need to do as a party is make sure that we are trusted with the NHS, because if we are not, we will simply not win elections. It's as simple as that. Now, I believe I am trusted with the NHS, because I did something difficult as Chancellor. I introduced a new way to fund the NHS and social care that wasn't easy, but I thought it was the right thing to do to support our doctors and nurses to help recover from the pandemic, get the backlogs down, and fix social care once and for all. Now, that can't be the end of the story, though, because whilst funding is important, we are conservatives, and we know that we don't measure our success by how much money we spend on things. As Michael demonstrated as Education Secretary, we measure our success by the outcomes we get for the people that we represent, and that's what we need to do. So whether, whether it's my plan to tackle the issue of missed appointments, because that will save us money and get the backlogs down, and that's being tough and different, whether it's changing how we do elective surgery in this country, how we do community diagnostic scanning, or how it's whether we change bad leadership in the NHS and call it out and replace it with good leadership, we need to be radical because we need better healthcare and we need lower taxes, and that's what we'll need to do to deliver and, it. And it just occurs to me, um, Sir Sunak, for some of my listeners, for some of the party members, your idea of missed appointments, just briefly remind people what that is. It's if you don't yes. turn up, I understand, you get, yes. uh, get fined. So, so it's simple. Last year in the NHS, 15 million appointments were missed. 15 million. Not just at our GP surgeries, but in our hospitals too. That's not right. It's depriving people of the care. It's not valuing our doctors and nurses' time properly. And yes, I want to charge for that. Because, not because I want to make money from it, but because I want to change the culture in this country so that's not as acceptable. Uh, and, uh, uh, and if we, and Nick, the beauty is, because if we can do that, if we, if we move to a system, if we move to a system where people cancel them in advance, we freed up all this extra healthcare capacity and no one's had to pay an, any, an extra pound of taxes and we can get people treated quicker. But it's the example of something radical and bold that we haven't tried that we're going to need to try if we want to actually grip this problem. What would... A lot of support. It has a lot of support. What would the level of fine be, Mr Sunak? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've, said, I've said £10, but 10 we pounds. should just look at it, because the, the but, evidence is... But I can't get the hospital to answer the phone to tell them I can't go over my bunion. They won't, well, they, I don't know if you've ever tried to ring a hospital. Yeah, it's well, quite a business. Yeah, no, no, and of course, we should have a system that makes it work. But okay. all the evidence but is will clear. need a system, won't it? Yes, it will. But you know what? All this, this is the thing. When you try something new, there'll all be all these people oh, no. who say, oh, gosh, you can't be that tough on people. No, no, there's always a good excuse. Or there'll be people who say, well, how will you ever get it to work? It's too complicated. You know what? We set up the furlough scheme in a matter of weeks and it saved 10 million jobs. I'm confident right. we can get I this know. done. I, I know you are, I know you are a, uh, a considerable fitness aficionado. When did you last need the NHS? Well, did I last need it? Well, actually, yeah. I, I mean, not to talk about it. My, my, uh, my father was brilliantly treated by my local hospital Brilliant. just last week. And the Brilliant. Friar Ridge in uh, North Yorkshire in North Allerton. So I just want to pay tribute and thanks to all the ma massive amount of staff at the Minder Injuries Unit who looked after him then. <laughs> Ni uh, Nigel, uh, you're on the next question. Nigel, go ahead, sir. Mr. Sunak, the uni unity of the United Kingdom must be a yeah. key point for the Prime Minister. Seeing the riot that the SNP runs in Parliament and the amazing 
statements that come from the leader in Edinburgh. How will you suppress Nicola Sturgeon? Yes. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Look, I, yeah, it's an excellent question. So, look, I think when it comes to Scotland, there's probably three things I would say to all of you that I would do as Prime Minister. I think the first is, the first is we need to more actively demonstrate the benefit of the United Kingdom government in Scotland. And that, that's something that we started doing, actually, with Michael and I worked together with Alistair Jack to demonstrate that the UK government was investing in Scottish communities for the first time, and it's changed the conversation. And at the same time, we get to call out the failures of Nicola Sturgeon's leadership, whether it comes to us, their schools or their hospitals. They're not performing as well as they should. So that's the first thing we need to do. The second thing is to remember, when it comes to the union in Scotland, who are we speaking to? Well, we're not just speaking to ourselves. We're not just speaking to Conservatives, right? We need to talk to all the other people in Scotland who don't vote Conservative but are unionists. So we need to have a leader who can speak to them, and I believe I can. And the third thing... And the third, and the third, thing, and the third thing, and probably the most important, is to remember this, that nationalism is an incredibly seductive and romantic idea. And if we only meet it with arguments about currency or borrowing or who's going to pay the pensions or trade, it won't be good enough. We've got to have an argument that speaks to people's hearts, an emotive argument. And when my grandparents came to this country, they didn't come to England. They came to the United Kingdom, probably like many of you, because it wasn't, to them, it wasn't geography. The United Kingdom wasn't just lines on a map. It represented a set of values. It represented a set of ideas. That's what binds us together, and that's the argument we're going to make, and that's how we're going to protect and, the union. OK. And, Mr Sunak, just, just lastly on that, do you view Nicola Sturgeon as an attention seeker and Mark Drayford as a low-energy Jeremy Corbyn? <laughs> Do you look, see them in that I, I think, look, in, in, in all these cases, right, we have to respect the fact that these are the legitimately elected leaders of Scotland and Wales, that the, the, the United Kingdom Prime Minister has to obviously work with them and constructively and demonstrate that to the people of Scotland, that we can work with them. But what do we need to do as Conservatives? We need to take the fight to them and beat them. That's what we need to do. Money is in Gerard's... Mr Sonnet. Money is in Gerard's Cross. Down there, money. Monique, hi. Good evening, Rishi. Um, at 23, I worked really hard, and I was able to buy a property um, that was without any parental support, just a strong work ethic. It was 20 years ago. My son is 16, and we, we do all we can to give him yeah. a strong work ethic. What is the likelihood of him being able to follow in our footsteps? Yeah. Oh, well, that's a great, great question. So, look, I, many of us, right, many of us, many of us here tonight will remember that magical feeling that we experienced when we got the keys to our first flat or our first house, right? How special was that? And then we may well have got married and built a life there and proved it. That is an incredible journey. It's a special journey and it is a conservative journey. And we need to make sure that that is possible for your son, Monique. So what are we going to do? Well, you know, we need to increase the supply of housing, right? You know, first of all, Sadiq Khan, failing as always to deliver affordable housing. But there's things we can do. We can densify in our urban areas in a way that is beautiful like European cities. We can increase the building on brownfield sites, where if we remediate them with government support, we can unlock a million sites across the country. And we need to overcome our British aversion to what we call flat pack housing, but the rest of the world calls modular housing because it's faster, higher quality and cheaper. But we also need to look at the mortgage market because many of you here, many of your kids and your grandkids are probably paying a hefty sum in rental payments. And actually, they could afford a mortgage, right, if they were given one. And indeed, the, the mortgage payment may well be lower than the rent payment that they're currently paying, right? And I can see lots of nodding. So that's why, that's why Michael and I, in our, Michael and I in our previous jobs, started a review of the mortgage market. And I started as chancellor a new 95% guaranteed mortgage. 
and it seems to be working because I keep meeting people who have got one. And if we can, if I'm elected, I want to turbocharge that policy because if we can get 95% mortgages for young first time buyers with a great credit history, then it won't take them decades to save up for the deposit and your son can get on the housing ladder quicker and so can a million more young people because that's what a conservative government should be delivering and that's what I would love to do. While you, while you rightly identify while you rightly identify Mayor Khan's woeful record of house building, the Conservatives haven't hit their target year after year either, have they? How would you address well, well, that? Well, actually, the, re the, the, uh, the record over the last few nationally. years has been some of the highest rates of house building that we've seen. I'm confident that Monique Sun and many others can experience the feeling that we all did. And, and you'll hit those, those targets fears. you set, those building targets that you set. No, I, I, it's, it's, it's right that we just increase the supply of housing, but we need to have practical ways to do it. There's no point having a target if you don't actually have the means to deliver it, so we should focus on the means. Uh, number one, Annabelle in Kent. Annabelle, Annabelle in Kent. Annabelle. As someone with a passion in musical theatre, I am concerned with what the pandemic has had on the West End and the industry as a whole. What specific things will you do to make sure that the West End is back up and running like it was before the pandemic? Yeah, yeah. right. Thank you, Annabelle. And, you know, you're right. It, it's such an important part of our country and particularly here, obviously, in London. And that's why in the pandemic, as in the midst of trying to save all our businesses and support jobs and think about that side of uh, what we had to do, thanks to, in part, the unbelievable lobbying and championing of Nikki Aitken, who's sitting right here, we, we set up something called the Cultural Recovery Fund. And together with the Arts Council and others, we managed to save pretty much all the theatres and cultural venues across the country from the bankruptcy and insolvency that they face in the pandemic. And I was recently at one of the events celebrating it, and it's been an extraordinary success. And that's something that should give you confidence that it's a sector that I completely champion. And that whether it, when it comes to the West End and everything else that Nikki does brilliantly, well, we need to make sure a few things. We need to make sure that London's safe, that it's a welcoming place for people. That's why crime is so important. But we also need to make sure that travel is easy, because London requires people to visit it. We need to make sure our visa regime is quick and it's simple for people to come that there aren't queues and we have fantastic places for them to stay when they're here. Those are all the things that Nikki's delivering as a local MP. Those are all the things I would be delighted to support her and all the London Conservatives to do. I, I, I'm not quite sure when you said crime why you pointed at me, but I'll, well, take no, no, it. No. <laughs> I'll just take that because we discussed it. We I'm discussed sure that it. That was How it. appropriate that it was <laughs> that it was a question about the theatre because we have to bring the curtain down. Your appreciation, oh. please, for Rishi Sunak. And, and my job is all but done, save to tell you that this, of course, will be being discussed on LBC. Now, I'm with you tomorrow morning, of course, from 7 to discuss it. If you've enjoyed me, I'm Nick Ferrari. If I'm not, I'm Vanessa Feltz. Could I please ask your appreciation for your party chairman, Andrew Stevenson, and thank you. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Can I just, on behalf of the Conservative Party, thank Nick and LBC for being our media partners for this, the final hustings. Over the past few weeks, we have held 12 fantastic hustings across the country. Uh, those hustings have been attended by 19,000 party members. Uh, there have been over 100,000 members watch those events online and through our media partners, they have been also broadcast to over a million members. Of Good afternoon. Today marks the culmination of the Conservative leadership election. 
It has been a huge honour to be co-chairman of our party, working alongside Ben Elliott. And I'm hugely proud of the way everyone has worked together to deliver this contest, which has shown the Conservative Party to be in good voice and good strength. We've held 12 regional hustings the length and breadth of the United Kingdom, attended by 2,000, sorry, 20,000 party members. <laughs> it's been a long campaign. 20,000 party members and watched online by over 2.5 million members of the public. The members' hustings involved are two fantastic candidates undergoing 14 hours of questioning and taking more than 600 questions from party members. And these hustings were in addition to the multiple online hustings and the media interviews. This concluded last Wednesday with a fantastic event at the Wembley Arena attended by 6,000 party members. I'd like to pay tribute to Darren Mott and the dedicated team at CCHQ for running the membership ballot. I'd also like to thank my parliamentary colleagues for their support throughout the process, and in particular, members of the 1922 Executive, ably led by Sir Graham Brady, who, have been running, who has been the returning officer throughout the process. But most of all, I'd like to thank our party members, who've undertaken the solemn duty of choosing our next leader and our next Prime Minister. Our members have engaged constructively, positively and thoughtfully in the process whilst also keeping busy getting our message out across the United Kingdom, something I've seen uh, at the 87 constituency associations I've campaigned with in the last few weeks. <laughs> Finally, I'd like to take this opportunity to say a huge thank you to our outgoing leader and Prime Minister, Boris Johnson. Yeah. His leadership through Brexit through the pandemic and now through the war in Ukraine was never going to be easy, but time and again he rose to the challenge and delivered for our country. It is now essential that we come together as a party and unite behind our new leader and our new Prime Minister to continue. Our new Prime Minister will build on the outgoing Prime Minister's legacy and continue to deliver prosperity, opportunity and security for everyone. So with no further ado, will you please warmly welcome our two fantastic candidates, Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss. Ladies and gentlemen, to announce the results of our leadership election, please welcome our returning officer, Sir Graham Brady. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, on the 7th of July, the Prime Minister announced his resignation as leader of our party. The 1922 committee then organised five ballots over an eight-day period concluding the part of the leadership election for which we have responsibility and putting forward 
the candidates to the National Convention and CCHQ for the programme of hustings all over the United Kingdom and the ballot of the membership that has now concluded. I work closely with the board of the party, CCHQ and Civica Electoral Services to ensure that all qualifying members had the opportunity to vote and to ensure that our ballot was secure as well as free and fair. I'd like to thank the 1922 executive, and in particular my fellow officers, Nazgani, Will Ragg, Sir Geoffrey Clifton Brown, Bob Blackman and Gary Sandbrook, and our staff for all of their help and support, especially during the administration of the parliamentary rounds of voting. I would like to thank the party board and staff for all their hard work organising the hustings, which allowed so many members to see the candidates in action, whether in person or online. I'm grateful to CES for the professionalism with which they have dealt with the ballot in distributing, collecting and counting the votes, both online and by post. Finally, I want to thank all the party members who have taken this responsibility very seriously. All the candidates who put themselves forward for election, and in particular, my colleagues Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss, who ran such excellent campaigns in the full glare of media scrutiny and who showed themselves to be outstanding candidates to be the leader of our party. Now the result. I, Sir Graham Brady, the returning officer for the Conservative and Unionist Party leadership election, declare that the total number of eligible voters was 172,437. The turnout in the election was 82.6%. The total number of votes rejected was 654. The total number of valid votes given to each candidate was as follows. Rishi Sunak, 60,399. Liz Truss, 81,326. Therefore, I give notice that Liz Truss is elected as the leader of the Conservative and Unionist Party. We'll come up on stage. Thank you, Sir Graham. It's an honour to be elected as leader of the Conservative and Unionist Party. I'd like to thank the 1922 Committee, the Party Chairman and the Conservative Party for organising one of the longest job interviews in history. Thank you very much. I'd also like to thank my family, my friends, my political colleagues and all of those who helped on this campaign. I'm incredibly grateful for all of your support. I'd like to pay tribute to my fellow candidates, particularly Rishi Sunak. It's been a hard fought campaign. I think we have shown the depth and breadth of talent in our Conservative Party. I also want to thank our outgoing leader, my friend, Boris Johnson. <laughs> Boris, you got Brexit done. You crushed Jeremy Corbyn. You rolled out the vaccine and you stood up to Vladimir Putin. You were admired from Kiev to Carlisle. Friends and colleagues, 
Thank you for putting your faith in me to lead our great Conservative Party, the greatest political party on earth. I know, I know that our beliefs resonate with the British people. Our beliefs in freedom, in the ability to control your own life, in low taxes, in personal responsibility. And I know that's why people voted for us in such numbers in 2019. And as your party leader, I intend to deliver what we promised those voters right across our great country. During this leadership campaign, I campaigned as a Conservative and I will govern as a Conservative. <laughs> and my friends, we need to show that we will deliver over the next two years. I will deliver a bold plan to cut taxes and grow our economy. I will deliver on the energy crisis, dealing with people's energy bills, but also dealing with the long-term issues we have on energy supply. And I will deliver on the National Health Service. But we all will deliver for, all, for our country. And I will make sure that we use all the fantastic talents of the Conservative Party, our brilliant members of Parliament and peers, our fantastic councillors, our MSs, our MSPs, all of our councillors and activists and members right across our country. Because my friends, I know that we will deliver, we will deliver, and we will deliver. And we, and we, and we will deliver a great victory for the Conservative Party in 2024. Thank you. Thank you.